right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, latest SL alumni panel, which is Three Paths in Medicine. Um, I'm Lassia. I'm going to be uh, moderating. And we have with us our lovely panelists. Guys, I'm just going to introduce you, so just go through your background. So first we have Vivian, who uh, is a field leader from UBC, right now a medical student at UBC. Vivian? Oh, hey. Oh, uh, now it's my turn. Hey. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a third year medical student um, at UBC. Um, interested in like infectious disease or public health as my specialty, um, very much uh, in line with circumstances at present. Um, and so I'm having a really uh, kind of interesting time navigating that both uh, on the medical student front and just on a personal kind of projects front. So we'll tell you more about that later. Yep, then we have Dr. Bruce. <laughs> who is a uh, shield leader at uh, University of Calgary and uh, did his MD over at University of Calgary as well. So you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hey guys, it's nice to meet you. Hope everyone's staying safe. Um, I'm Bruce. I'm a second year urology resident at University of Toronto. Um, guys considering medicine, urology is a great specialty. Uh, we blast kidney stones with lasers, remove cancer with robots, and um, uh, we can make penis jokes at work. <laughs> I'd like to remind our panelists that this is recorded and will be, will be put out to the whole network later. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then last we have uh, Paul, who uh, did his undergrad at UVic and is currently an MD candidate at U of T. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul. I, uh, I'm a Shulik leader from UVic, and I'm currently in third year at uh, U of T. And I am interested in uh, emergency medicine or family medicine. And I uh, hope you guys have all been staying safe as well. I'm excited to kind of get going and help you guys maybe answer some questions and see um, what kind of conversation comes up today. Yeah, awesome. So we have some like set questions that we put aside, but we have so many people on the call. So I think towards the end, we'll start taking some Q&A. Uh, and David, just let me know when we uh, end the call. Just like kick me off or something. We can do it that way. So first off, guys, the first question that I sent you guys, um, what made you decide to pursue a medical career? And what are you passionate about within medicine? Why do you keep doing it every day? Anyone jump in? I can, I can start off, sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is like a question that I actually continue to ask a lot of people uh, that I meet in the field of medicine, um, especially mentors like older people, because you get a different story every time. But usually it's like a personal story, some kind of personal experience, exposure behind uh, the reason why. And uh, for me, it's like, it's a mixture of just being exposed to a lot of science uh, growing up. So I did uh, biochem in undergrad, I uh, was also very interested in science as a kid. And then uh, realistically, I kind of wanted to do research, uh, kind of like you last year and did biochemistry wanted to do research, but I uh, ended up uh, doing a bunch of research in cancer research and, um, you know, liking it, but also wanting a human connection aspect to it. Uh, and I kind of figured medicine was the next reasonable step to that. So uh, I kind of ruled out my options being research and worked with a few companies before deciding to do medicine. And then uh, after working with companies and doing industry as well as academic research, I kind of figured that uh, medicine was the way to go. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in next because my story kind of, kind of resonates and is along the same same lines as Paul's. Um, I went into science um, in undergrad and kind of left it open as to like what I would be pursuing after that. Um, initially, very much wanted to do a master's of public health um, as kind of the next step and uh, was guided by a lot of my mentors who kind of noted that like my interest in research and my interest in projects and um, my capacity for, for doing that along with, with schoolwork and um, encouraged me to consider an MD instead. And initially I was pretty uh, apprehensive because I didn't want to do another four years of school and like another five years of training after that. Um, but I have no regrets of, of going into medicine and um, I, I do it and I'm interested in kind of the intersections of you know, public health and infectious diseases because it allows me also to combine a lot of the humanitarian work that I do and a lot of the um, kind of global health research pieces and um, gives me the skill set to be able to um, you know, apply, apply both knowledge and practical 
um, skills when I'm in the field um, and when I'm kind of doing um, the EPI research component of it. So it's a very good uh, kind of marrying of, of many facets of my life. Um, and it's why I continue to be passionate about it. I have to agree with both of what both of you guys said. I think it's a practical set of skills that let you help other people um, from diagnosis to um, management to talking to the patient. It's, um, it's uh, really something special that you can do to help other people, um, especially in surgery. Uh, I think you can see that more so than ever when you do like a three hour procedure, two hour procedure and uh, you know, fix something with your hands. It's very gratifying. And then uh, I think it's a great uh, opportunity for innovation as well, medicine. Um, to apply it somehow, for sure. Cool. Um, can everyone still hear okay? There was a bit of a, I heard a bit of a break up there. Okay, good. So uh, next question, I guess more of a fun one. What's a really great story from your time as a medical student that you'd like to share? I've heard some really funny ones. I just want to hear what you guys had. Oh, I got, I was some from as a medical student and then about other medical students while I'm a resident. Uh, as a medical student, the funniest story has got to be when I was on my general surgery rotation. My chief sent me down to go see a uh, appendicitis consult. I use urine emerge. The only thing I got to tell you is he's an inmate, like he's still in prison. Well, all right, I'm just, just do my thing, do a history, feel his belly, see what I think. I'll walk into the room and there's nobody in the room, just an empty room. I turn and talk to the security guard. I'm like, uh, like I, I can't find this guy. I heard he's an inmate. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, he's just using the washroom. He's actually over here, I'm watching, I'm, I'm watching him. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna sit there and wait for him as well. We like wait there for like five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes pass, nothing happens. This guy's still in the room, I don't know, taking the biggest dump of his life. I'm like, uh, like I'm, I'm no security guard, but she, she need to check on this guy? Like he could have appendicitis. And so he like, break, he breaks down the door and there's nobody in the bathroom. And we look up, and then the ceiling tile is moved to the side and then there's a hole in the ceiling. There's no patient to be found. I'm like, oh my God. The entire emergency room is in a panic. These security guards are going nuts. <sighs> Nearby in fast track. Apparently I didn't see this, but by some like little old lady, this like inmate falls through the ceiling and it scares everybody there. The funny thing about this story is that in the psych, in the psych department of the emergency department, Everybody was commenting on how they were hearing something in the ceiling, but nobody was believing them because they're in the psych ward. Anyways, it was a crazy story about like escaping inmate patient um, who probably didn't have appendicitis and probably wanted to escape. Anyone have a story they want to follow that one with? That's I know more. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Paul, did you have one that you wanted to share first? Oh, you, you go ahead, Vivian. Mine, mine was definitely not funny, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if mine's like funny, but that reminded me of, um, I was like really struggling of, about this question, like what am I going to share? But I was on psychiatry and um, one of our patients, so this is like a long, um, like a patient who's had schizophrenia for a long time. And when I was on my surgical rotations, there were like rumors that there was like, like urine leaking into the OR. And it's like kind of weird, like, you know, where would this urine be coming from? And nobody, like nobody could figure it out. And we kind of left it at that. And I finished my surgical rotation and then moved on, right? Um, and when I was on psychiatry, I had this patient and I was reviewing his chart um, about his history and like how he came to uh, to be in the hospital and I was like oh like a few months ago um, he was found in the like VGH tunnels and he would be like uh, urinating uh, everywhere and then the the complaint came from um, the surgeons who complained of like urine leaking to the OR and I was like oh my goodness I was there like that was I whoa and it was like full circle and now this person is my patient yeah I like it wow it's all my <laughs> Must have been the urologist that complained. 
obviously. <laughs> um, my story is not, mine's just wholesome, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's more wholesome than funny, but uh, I love it. Wholesome I mean, good. I think this is more along the lines of like what uh, Bruce is saying, but like it's it's a field where like, you know, you get to really make an impact on, on people's lives. And uh, I recently just completed my internal medicine rotation. Internal medicine is kind of where you're doing really hands-on work and you get to um, uh, do some of the procedures that uh, you, you don't normally get to do in, in family or like maybe some of the other specialties. So um, there's a patient of mine who is about my age and in his 20s and really nice guy. He had uh, a lot of chronic uh, gastrointestinal symptoms that uh, no one could really figure out what's going on. He's coming in and uh, it had been 10 years of these symptoms kind of, kind of on and off. Um, and, you know, after really talking to him, getting a thorough history, it seemed like he had gotten all this work up. And uh, as a kid, he, he had a ton of CTs, a ton of MRIs, a ton of imaging, and nothing was very conclusive. So uh, I kind of had the opportunity to do like a full workup. As like a student, you get assigned like a couple of patients and you get a lot of time compared to the attending because the attending has to see like 20 or 30 people, right? And so as a student, you kind of get like your handful of like four or five patients and then you spend your entire day with them. And so, uh, you know, he was mentioning how like, wow, like you're spending a ton of time with me. Like, don't you have more patients to see? And I'm like, no, like you're kind of like the only guy I've left on the day. And <laughs> uh, so I was able to really like think of more workup uh, to do on this patient and um, uh, spend a bit of uh, thinking brain power, uh, kind of figuring out what was going on with them. And eventually we diagnosed him with this uh, very, very rare disease. Uh, but to do that, we, we had to do something called a paracentesis. And uh, what that is, it's like you have to stick a needle into the side of someone's abdomen who has um, ascites, which is fluid in your abdomen. And, uh, you know, I'm starting to do this procedure and uh, the patient nice. is looking at me like, uh, you know, have you done this before? And I'm like, yeah, just on, just like a couple of times. He's like, how many times have you done it? And I'm like, once or twice. <laughs> and uh, obviously there was a supervisor there and everything went well, but uh, that was... Um, one of the times I really distinctly remember thinking, wow, like, you know, this patient had been going through all these symptoms for 10 years, no one figured out what had gone on. And finally, after uh, doing an ultrasound and figuring out that he had fluid in his stomach, we kind of did this paracentesis, figured out he had this very rare disease from this, uh, you kind of get a sense of accomplishment from it and um, really, really helps you understand why being in the field uh, is, is considered um, uh, very privileging in a way because you get to talk to people about their stories and what they do and what they've gone through. Uh, so super grateful to be in a field like this. Nice work, man. Yeah, that's an awesome story. Yeah, you deserve that procedure too. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? You actually yeah. earn it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm actually going to swap the order of the next two questions because I think that makes a bit more sense. So I'm going to jump straight to um, what do you guys like? What's your top advice for students who are interested in following a similar path to you or pursuing a career in medicine? Maybe I'll jump in here. I, I always give this piece of advice for friends who are interested in medicine or like pre meds who want to get advice for, you know, what is medicine like or whatever. Um, and that is don't think of medicine, like, don't think of medical school as your end goal. Um, you should have like a, I don't know if this is like very idealistic uh, wording, but like a, a greater purpose that you're aiming for in life um, and that you're using medicine as a vehicle uh, to achieve that. And um, I see this as um, becoming an issue for peers who um, they spend so long kind of gunning for medicine. Like they spend a long time trying to get in. They're like, you know, strategically, like, you know, putting their extracurriculars and making your, you know, your CV look good. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, the pitfall of, of that strategy is when you get into medicine, you ask yourself like, well, now I'm in, like what, what now? And you kind of lose a sense of who you are because it takes a lot of effort to get in and it's not an easy feat, but, um, a lot of folks kind of lose themselves when when they're in medicine and then now they're like well i don't i don't know what's the next step for me and i don't know you know which specialty to pick like what kind of values do i even use to make that decision because i i haven't thought about this kind of greater purpose um with of what i want to do with my life and so i would i always tell um my mentees and folks to to consider that and to give it thought and to use medicine as a skill set and a toolbox 
um, for you to kind of go on and, and make greater impact. And it's, it's not the end goal in and of itself. That's awesome advice. Uh, Bruce, Paul? You want to go ahead, Bruce? Sure. Um, yeah, I agree with what you said, Vivian. I think you also really need to figure out uh, if medicine is right for you. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, and I don't think I fully realized that going in. My average day as a surgery resident is I wake up at 6 a.m. and I work until 6.30 to 7. I do that five days a week. Every four days, I work 24 hours in a row. I don't go home the next day. Two times every month, I work the full weekend. And I don't take a post call on Monday. It's a lot of work that you dedicate yourself to learn the skills to provide the service to take care of your patients. If you'll get sick 24 seven, even with this coronavirus stuff, you can't just work from home. You still got patients to see, you got things to do. So I think you really need to think hard about medicine and make sure that is something you want to do. Otherwise you're gonna really not enjoy your time that you're putting in. I think that's like a, something to really consider. And um, I think this is a good step to start talking to people in medicine and start um, seeing what the hospital's like and um, maybe shadowing some people to really figure out whether this is something to do that you wanna do. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Bruce and Vivian there. It, it's really a cost benefit analysis here. Um, the amount of time that you'll be spending working eventually, like in medicine as a resident, as, as a clerk, uh, is, is a lot. It really is. And so uh, for people like, like you guys who have a lot of interests and want to do a lot of things, and Vivian and I were talking about this uh, a couple of days ago, but um, you know, if you have a lot of hobbies and things that you like doing outside of school, sometimes it makes it really tough because you're working that like 12, 14 hours a day and then you come back home and you don't really have that reserve to go on and do that thing that you want to do, like produce music or whatever it is, right? Uh, so it's definitely, it's definitely like a very um, uh, tough decision to make, but it's rewarding. Uh, at the same time, you know, I would also say that uh, medicine is one of those fields where you get to make a really big difference in people's lives but at the same time it's also uh, a little bit glorified by our culture um, in the sense that like um, you get to experience medicine as a whole and like do do all of medicine uh, through your your training but at the same time you kind of don't get that other aspect of uh, experiencing what you could be doing like starting a company or doing something that uh, might be a side project of yours as a job, right? Um, on top of that, there's a there's a really good story that uh, a mentor of mine told me, where, uh, you know, medicine is really just another field, right? And it's it's not any more important than than another uh, specialty. And the reality is that uh, you help people in most STEM fields that people in the shoe like community are in uh, as an engineer, as not an engineer and something else, right? Um, and the story that this mentor was telling me about was more so about how he went to uh, a conference where uh, an eMERGE doc was talking at this burnout conference. And uh, he was talking about how you should really treat medicine as this field where uh, it's a job, right? Like at the end of the day, it's still a job, right? And uh, one of the audience members stood up and asked the speaker saying, you know, but how can it be just a job if I'm saving people's lives and uh, doing all these things that are helping people in a time of need? And the speaker uh, asked him, like, do you think the waiter who served you food today has a more important or you have a more important job than the waiter who served you food today? And the guy in the audience says, uh, yeah, like, obviously I do. Like, how can you, how can you say that? Like, you know, we're, we're here doing um, things that are saving lives in medicine, right? And so then the speaker uh, shot back by saying, do you think it, your job's still more important if the waiter is a single dad and he's trying to keep food on the table for his two kids, right? Do you still think your job's more important? 
And obviously, like when you think of medicine in that kind of perspective, where um, you know it's this job that's very, very important to society, and a lot of us want to go into medicine, want to do medicine because it's to help other people, but you can do it in other ways as well. I'm not trying to deter people from going into medicine, more just saying that there are a lot of options out there where you can pursue your passions and things like that, where you have a lot of time to do other things as well. Um, and so it really is going to be a cost benefit analysis on your personal end that you need to consider. Mm. That's a really good point about the mental health aspect as well. At some point you need to sit down and consider why doctors have the highest suicide rate of any uh, profession or why, do why a third or a half of doctors are depressed at some point in their career or in their life. You need to sit down and consider that. Yeah. I, I would say as, as a resident, it's probably like two or three times a year, I do something that seriously harms another person. And I, it's because I'm training, right? I'm a surgical resident, I'm training. And uh, for like a week after, I just can't stop thinking about it. I can't, I can't fall, fall asleep at night. And uh, it, it's something that nobody t told me that is something I, I'd experience as a doctor or as a surgical trainee. But at the same time, on the other hand, there's nothing more gratifying than the thank you of a patient that you've helped. There's nothing more gratifying than doing something with your hands and fixing it than like being in the operating room and then cutting out like a, a tumor with, with your staff. It's amazing. It's like, I just cured this guy's cancer. So there's definitely highs and lows and uh, the mental health aspects are very important. I actually wanted to follow up and ask a question um, based on something that Paul said, where it was that, uh, you know, like medicine as a career is almost glorified sometimes in our society. With a lot of the stuff that's happening now, especially around the pandemic, where medical staffs are being called, you know, heroes and all of that, and their response is always like, don't call us heroes, just give us the PPE. Do you think that like part of that whole almost hero worship around the medical profession sometimes actually acts against the interest of people within the profession? You know, that's very interesting. I, I feel like it can. Um, the, the problem with, I think, glorifying any specialty for that matter is, uh, you know, you got to hold everyone accountable still, right? And so um, if you, if you're saying like, you know, oh my God, like, thank you for doing a job and uh, thank you for being a hero during this time. Of course, those people deserve uh, the, the 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 merit that they're that they're getting at the, at a time like this, where they're risking their lives to to do their job. But um, you know, in in another aspect, it's also part of the job set that you signed up for, right? So uh, it is our job to 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 help people um, as as a doctor, right? So in, in a way, um, I feel like the 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 glorification currently. Um, I understand it, but uh, there, there's an aspect of it that definitely I feel like um, is sometimes taken a bit too far, especially like on, on pop culture media and like, you know, there's a lot of TV shows about medicine that really does glorify like the job a lot. Uh, and it just doesn't happen that way, unfortunately, in, in the real world. Did anyone have anything to add on that question before we move on? Nope. I think I agree with what you said, Paul. Cool. Uh, well, I, we're kind of switching gears now, going more towards the pandemic and COVID-19 and the situation as it is right now. Uh, definitely, a, I, I would imagine an interesting time to be in a medical related field. Um, along those lines, uh, I know that some of um, you have been very active, Vivian. I know you have been very active. Is there a project or initiative that you've been involved in, not necessarily COVID related, but just in your time as a medical student or a medical professional that you're particularly proud of that this path sort of let you take part in? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That was weird. Feedback? I'm getting lots of feedback. Yeah, okay, it's gone now. I don't know what that was, but it's fine now. I think it, it works like differently with people's mute buttons and stuff, but. Mm -hmm. I can share a little bit about like the COVID medical students response thing that we're doing. Um, so essentially there's a lot of medical students all across Canada who are doing um, something very similar. Um, but essentially the idea is that 
with medical students being pulled out of our clinical rotations, a lot of us are now um, like we don't have school or we have kind of online classes and it's like a modified program and very much a lot of us are kind of sitting at home, um, not involved. Um, and so what we decided to do with kind of this free time and with um, the connections that we have was provide um, kind of a resource um, and services to frontline workers, whether that be you know, running personal errands, like getting groceries or um, helping with childcare for, for families who have you know, um, like caregivers or parents who are on the front lines um, or anything extending to like public health contact tracing. Um, we've kind of mobilized our medical class um, to take part in those activities and have developed a framework that is scalable so that other um, healthcare disciplines like students in nursing, midwifery, um, like OT, for example, that they can do the same for um, the frontline workers uh, in their respective professions. Um, and so I've been busy over the past month kind of coordinating that and it's been um, both a very good learning experience for, for myself um, and also uh, I think a, a, quite a privilege to be able to be involved in this way uh, when we're not able to be on the front lines um, with the colleagues and the residents and the staff that we were working with, um, you know, just a month ago. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Vivian. Yeah, that's awesome. Bruce, what uh, projects have you been working on? <laughs> I want I want to reiterate and say that it doesn't have to be like right this instant. I just mean over your time as a medical student or in the medical profession. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, there's a lot to do. I mean, a lot, a lot in the research aspect, um, trying to figure out a way to let patients do virtual follow-ups in the time of COVID um, through like a mobile app. We just submitted a paper in Nature on that, see what happens. Nice. Um, for medical school, I used to do some app programming. I'm not the best though. Uh, we made like a, made like a solar company called Simply Solar. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I let people in developing countries use their phones to line solar panels. Oh, wow. some, somehow I had like installations in over 130 countries around the world, including one in North Dang. Korea. <laughs> oh, okay. Which was sick. Yeah, I don't want to know what he's aligning there. <laughs> so uh, this is a lot of projects too. What about you, Paul? That's awesome, man. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely like lots of lots of projects that have gone on over the past three years for me. Um, I guess the most recent one that I can think of is during the, the COVID pandemic. But, you know, I haven't been doing a ton of stuff. So if you, if you guys have been like a couch potato through this, uh, it's totally OK, because I definitely have been as well. But um, the only thing that I really got involved with was helping uh, a couple of com companies developed this. Uh, uh, it's a it's a remote monitoring device for uh, patients who get sent home uh, from the hospital but are at high risk for uh, respiratory failure or any kind of um, medical emergency, really. And so it monitors like the five medical signs uh, through a patch-based format uh, on the chest. Uh, or the wrist or kind of like that. But it's not like I've been like producing this thing. It's really just like I've been helping and advising these companies. It's like, there's not been like a ton of work, but uh, um, that's been what I've been, what I've been up to for the past little bit. Uh, other than that, really just like research and uh, I kind of enjoy doing, um, what's, what's the word? Like, I guess like non-medical research and just like perspective writing. So I do a bit of that. Um, and yeah. You, you say that like it's not a very big deal, but that does yeah. sound like a very cool project that you're... It wasn't like a ton of time sink in there. It's just more like uh, someone reached out to me to, to ask for some questions and like help out with the grant writing. So I just like, you know, help them write a grant and stuff like that, but it didn't take a ton of time, so. That sounds that's awesome. awesome. That's awesome. That yeah. That sounds awesome. Uh, there's a whole lot of people we just can't discharge from the hospital. Fully. Yeah. Maybe they don't have a bed, maybe they're not safe to go. It's expensive to keep them. 
think it's safer as well if you're, if you're working. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the next two questions almost that I gave you guys can kind of be combined, which is like, what's your thoughts on this whole pandemic and the response both worldwide and sort of in your own communities within your medical schools or your, the places where you're working, your workplace, like how, what are just your overall thoughts and sort of feelings about how things are going in response to this really kind of almost movie-like situation that we're all sort of living in right now? You guys want to go first? It's all yours, Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I think I want to lend a different, like, a reminder, perhaps, and a different angle on this. Like, I know there's so much um, busy work going on. Like, people are mobilizing. There's lots of kind of frontline efforts. But I think at the heart of everything, it's important to remember that this is a pandemic and people are dying. Uh, it's a time of grief and, and loss, um, not just, like, of our loved ones who are passing, but also loss of, of dreams and hopes and kind of people's plans that have been lined up for really like the rest of the year um, have now been on hold. And I think it's important that we, um, that we strive to kind of empathize with um, folks who, for whatever reason and at whatever you know, situation they're in are, are going through some, some type of loss. Um, I'm currently writing a, um, like a manuscript um, on this kind of the mobilization efforts and um, I'm devoting a, quite a bit of space in the discussion on, on the topic of productivity shaming, um, which is a term that's like popped up, you know, been tweeted and, and um, brought up over social media of the fact that people are expecting almost that folks are using this time to learn a new language or learn it have a new hobby like there's all this like dog going to coffee stuff right like oh like let's let's like you know be better cooks and do uh, be you know better homemakers and like let's grow um like a new garden like people are expecting folks to to just magically kind of gear up and and use this time well and that if you know if these things don't materialize then that means You've been, a, you've been a failure over the past, you know, two months of social isolation or whatever. But in fact, that's not the kind of message that um, we want to, we want to spread. And, and I think especially as, as people in the medical profession, understanding that this is very much like an outbreak um, and, and being, uh, being careful with our language and being careful with um, kind of the interpersonal relationships that we have with our peers and and how we're framing this and how maybe some of our actions that we're doing during this time um, may not resonate with them. And um, so, yeah, so just that kind of lends to the whole situation as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. There's a lot of, I've seen a lot of like really odd things out there, which are kind of along the lines of like, oh, you know, you have all this time. It's a great time to learn all this stuff you wanted to learn. And it's like, it's a deeply difficult situation for everyone. It's not easy for everyone to be like, there's no expectation to be productive when you're going through a global catastrophe. Like don't make that an expectation. Yeah, I totally agree. I just want to tack on like, it's, it's literally our job right now to socially isolate, right? So like, <laughs> yes, be unproductive and like to be at home is part of our, like our job. And so like, don't feel bad about that, right? Like that's, that's what, uh, what most of us have been doing. Um, yeah, and I, and I think secondary to that as well, uh, there's a lot of people in the front lines who are, are doing um, a ton of work and like to support them with some of the initiatives, even like as basic as uh, helping like source PPE and stuff like that. Like that's, that's easy enough. And like there are things that you can do from home if you really feel like you wanna do things, um, that's more than necessary, but you don't need to feel like you, you have to learn a new language or anything like that. I, uh, I'm Korean, so like I actually like have set myself this goal of like learning Korean, but like I set this goal like uh, three months ago, and like I haven't touched like a Korean learning language book yet. So, um, yeah, it's there. You go. Yeah, I'm playing a lot of video games, playing a lot of Fortnite. Nice. <laughs> One hundred percent agreed. Yes. <laughs> Animal Crossing for a while. Dude, Doom not... Eternal? Anyone doing Doom Eternal? 
Is it good? Uh, no, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. I don't have that sort uh -huh. of money. I've bought too many video games. <laughs> Did anyone have anything else to add kind of on just overall thoughts about the response and what's going on around the world? I only speak for Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, we're still going to work. Um, I think we're flattening the curve here. Um, and we'll keep on top of the patients. It is a bit of a different environment when you walk into the hospital though. I think, um, um, more than ever, we need to rally as a team and try and figure out, try not to make any snap judgments or assumptions about why someone might be doing what they are, like if a nurse is being a bit of a jerk or um, like a patient's being uncooperative, you don't know their hidden story or what's actually happening. A lot of it, like coronavirus, very stressful time. Um, I think... Um, Overall, I think the response being it's being pretty good. There's some talk of like, you know, like I, I think there's there's plans in place for if things were to go um, go in the wrong direction. So there's plans to redeploy physicians or or nursing to other specialties if they need it, and they trained us to do it. I know a urology resident might be in the ICU is kind of terrifying, but they like put it in place to let us do it. Um, so I think things are going in the right direction. Um, and uh, hopefully it stays this way and improves. Yeah, uh, Vivian, Paul, anything to add there? Or... No? Okay. Um, one thing that kind of seems to have come out of this whole pandemic is that what's being kind of pushed or maybe this isn't being pushed more into the public lands, maybe I'm just noticing it more, but sort of the interactions between the general public or government level officials with the scientific and medical community suddenly seems to be a lot more either scrutinized or a lot more publicized. Well, I mean, how do you guys sort of feel about how it is right now and how do you hope it's gonna change as it goes forward? Yeah, that's certainly, uh... Good question. I actually uh, find that being in the medical field, you're exposed to a lot of the information like, um, like straight from the pipeline. So like you kind of know what's going on uh, in the immediate term, which is really nice. But uh, there's a disconnect between like me and, you know, like some of my friends or like some of my friends, friends who uh, don't really may not be trusting of what's uh, being said out there. And like, I actually personally know some people who are like, you know, I think COVID is a uh, is a hoax and like it's not like real right and then, which sounds totally ridiculous and I, I <laughs> and it is ridiculous but um, the reality is is like if you're not seeing the people coming into the hospital or the people dying on ventilators like you you don't you don't see those the number right and so like um, I think that most people are getting a really really good sense of uh, uh, the day-to-day -day what's going on from the news and like from uh, Bonnie on TV and like all the MOHs on TV and uh, uh, government officials on TV kind of giving out that information but I know that there's like a handful of people out there who just don't trust media sources period and um, don't really understand like why we're doing social distancing and things like that and I don't know the answer to this I'm just kind of like putting it out there but like there are people like that who just need to be reached in a different kind of way but I not sure what that way is. Uh, but for the most part, to answer your question, for the most part, I like that um, there's been a really good bridging where like they're bringing together scientific professionals to the general public and like letting them explain what's going on, especially like with um, uh, news outlets who are like, you know, showing visual graphic diagrams of flattening the curve and all that kind of stuff that came out a few weeks ago. I think that was a great way of showing it where like, you know, you have those boxes of like people and then like, you know, one person infected that's like moving around and like infecting other people and you see how quickly it can spread if you don't do social distancing. Um, but yeah, I, I really love that. And I like the fact that um, most people seem to be getting the message in a, in a positive way. Yeah. Donald Trump, eh? 
You can see this Lysol bleach comment. I was trying not to outright say that, but yeah, you caught on to my, my subtext there. Unmitigated disaster. There's just some like people eating bleach now or something. Oh boy. I think overall, I agree with you, Paul. I think it's been, it's been good. Yeah. Yeah, I think overall it's especially been quite good in Canada, right? Um, mm -hmm. Very grateful for that. Yeah, I, I resonate with the two points that you brought up. And and I experienced this like personally, like my parents are like well-educated, like master's degree graduates, but then in our family WhatsApp chat, it's like fake news all the time. And it's like random videos that my dad finds on YouTube. And it's like, oh my goodness, like this thing about coronavirus. I'm like, yo, like, that's not true. And I'm like, hello. I said always WhatsApp. I don't yeah, know why it's like, always watch. I'm, I'm right here. Like, you can just ask me questions. Like, stop sending it to, like, all your friends. Um, and, I, and I think you're right, Paul. And I, I think there's, a, like, really room for, uh, like, a different kind of knowledge translation if we want to put it back into, like, scientific terms um, and, like, knowledge dissemination amongst the wider public and, and the way in which we do that when folks who are not in STEM fields are not, you know, well-versed in the language and lingo of, you know, medicine or, or health, like anything to do with healthcare. Like how do we reach these people and how do we make information simple enough for them to believe and to understand? And then secondly, on your other point, I think that there is a huge need for more medical professionals in the realm of politics. Um, like I, Agreed. yeah, I, I'm per, like, kind of active on Twitter and I see that there's a lot of activity there in terms of like dialogue between like politicians and um, medical professional there's like there's lots of like it's a platform for discussion but it's not happening in a way that lay people can see um, and I think that more um, like medical physicians should step up and for example like, run for office um, I really see that there, like there is a huge need there and that's um, something I'm very passionate about. I think people should be well versed in like political language. It's very hard, I think, to learn when like this is not stuff they teach you in medical school. Um, but I think it's it's really important, and I think we cannot, especially in Canada, um, the the impacts of politics in medicine and vice versa is 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 quite significant. And, like a lot of our tax dollars goes into like healthcare spending. Um, and I don't think in general, like a lot of physicians know the nuances of how that works or know the nuances of how like hospital funding schemas work and, and like how innovation works and like how, like all this extra stuff works. And so, um, I would like, I very much am passionate about this little niche. And I think that, um, there is room for a lot of, a lot more like physicians in the political field in general. If you run for office, we'll all vote for you. Oh, I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah, like, this, like decades in the future, maybe <laughs> one day, if, I, if you see me on, on TV, I will <laughs> be getting you guys to all help with, with the campaign. Yeah, I, I just want to say though, that's, that's a really good point because like, um, you know, this, this grant that uh, the, the companies I'm working with are trying to apply to, it like, the application seems to be written by somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. Like, uh, <laughs> That's right. Like it's asking for, for example, like the grant is a, it asked for a non-invasive blood pressure, uh, continuous blood pressure monitoring. And the grant is like, oh, like we prefer it if you use applanation tonometry, which is like where you essentially flatten a vessel uh, to get the blood pressure through a force and then a calculation using that force that you put on the vessel. Um, and then they're like on the carotid. And it's like, bruh, like you can't do that. Because First of all, like you're going to give someone stroke, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, like that doesn't make any sense because who wants to wear like a, like a thing around their neck, right? As a, a collar. <laughs> exactly, right? And so this is a government grant that came out. And you, expect, you would expect like some doctors to have vetted the application, obviously. But like it seems like uh, that really didn't happen. And that there is such a need for more people in medicine who are interested in politics and, um, you know, have that have that mindset of like uh, changing some of the policies that go around uh, in our society.
Yeah, one thing that I just wanted to quickly mention, and I know this is a little bit like tangential, but I was having a, um, a chat with a good friend of mine who's a biomedical engineer yesterday, and he was mentioning that, for example, all the ventilator projects that's now popping up because of COVID, like in his perspective, like he does a lot of work with like Health Canada and like approvals for medical devices. And he's like, yeah, look at the gazillion ventilator projects that's popping up, like guaranteed 90% of them are not even gonna like be approved by Health Canada. Like they're gonna take one look and be like, these people do not have the right procedures. They don't have the right ISOs. They don't have the right legal like contracts. They don't have anything in place. And like, we can't even pass this. So like, what is the purpose of that? And and then we can ask like broader societal questions of like, okay, what is the purpose of grant funding? Like what is the purpose of um, like funding kind of these startup companies and all the little like logistics of that. But I think that there is real room for, for physicians and medical professionals to be involved in these conversations and say, hey, look, like I understand this group of like, you know, biomedical engineers are trying to get this startup going, but we need to think about like the scale up piece and like, is this even gonna be feasible? And is this even gonna be impactful? for the patients that we hope that these devices will be helping. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. Um, and actually like the, the grants for the ventilators, Vivian, are the same kind of grants that, uh, uh, that we just applied to. And so it, uh, it just goes to show that like, you know, the people who are making these grants are not the people who are gonna be eventually approving them in the, in the long run. And uh, that disconnect is like something that you would expect to be bridged already, but it's, it's not at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what you guys are saying and more from like a, a research point of view. Um, I think it's important that researchers also try and connect more with the public um, instead of kind of treating science as almost a glass palace where it's like, oh, the a certain segment of po the population belongs here and then the others, it's okay if they don't understand science because it's like when the like pandemic was first starting and everyone was panicking and, you know, like buying up all the toilet paper and that sort of stuff. Um, I noticed that a lot of my friends and colleagues in the sciences kind of treated it more with amusement than anything else. And what was going through my head was like, yeah, but I mean, a large part of it is that they don't have access to the same sort of data that you have access to, and they don't know how to interpret it, even if they do. So shouldn't we be helping them rather than laughing at them? And so I kind of agree that, yeah, it's important that there's more people who are interested in that sort of more public outreach, public policy side. Um, at this point, yeah, I'm gonna say we're gonna open up Q&A to the public or to everybody. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask or type it into the chat. Yeah, and as, as I put down, like it can be anything, like I, I'm sure yeah. the three of us are happy to answer like even personal questions or things about like the path to medical school or in medical school. So don't worry about like asking about these political nuances. <laughs> Yeah, like we don't. Yeah, we we don't want to talk about politics. Anymore. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, we have we have one in the chat right now, um, which is that the pandemic reduced ER or clinical visits. So, do you think people are missing the um, early diagnosing opportunities? A hundred percent, hundred percent. I see it all the time. People are presenting later in their illnesses now that coronavirus is a thing. For example, we had a guy like two. Mm -hmm two weeks ago, and uh, he had testicular torsion. This basically when when your your testicle pulls a Tony Hawk and does like a 720 and loses its blood flow. It's like a surgical emergency because if you don't, you don't unwrap that ball, it's gonna die. Then you gotta take him to the OR originally. So this guy had testicular torsion. He stayed at home for three days and we got him to the OR afterwards and it was just completely dead necrotic testicle and we had to cut it out. And he said that if coronavirus wasn't a thing, he probably would have gone to the hospital immediately. So, 100%. Just a whole anecdote case. Oh, boy. Um, oh, and then there was a follow-up, which was that the pandemic has reduced daily exercise for people and increased um, alcohol tolerance. So do you think that or sorry, increased alcohol use. So do you think that after the pandemic passes, there's going to be more problems spiking because of that? And how is that going to affect the healthcare system? Yeah, I mean, that this is definitely more of a long-term question for sure. Um, but I can see it being uh, a problem because of how long the COVID crisis is going to go on for. Like, you know, we've, there's some models out there talking about like years, right? And it's not, it's not to say that we're going to have social distancing for years, but 
um, even in this like few months uh, period, it's, you can definitely tell that there are people who are, uh, have reduced activity have been drinking more. Um, the fun fact that the reason why that uh, the uh, liquor stores are still open though is because people um, uh, who have alcohol dependence, uh, it's, it's quite a serious medical condition to have alcohol withdrawal. So you have to maintain uh, the liquor stores open so that like people can still access alcohol. But I do know that a lot of my friends and people our age are just like drinking or, um, you know, to pass the time they're, they're uh, just staying at home and uh, drinking and whatnot. So um, the other part of your question was, does, is the Canadian healthcare system ready for it? Uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, I feel like the Canadian healthcare system is, is relatively uh, well equipped, but like the pandemic has really shown that we are not equipped for crises like these. So I guess it depends on the number of people who, um, uh, who are going to have, you know, any kind of chronic conditions and outcomes due to this. But uh, I would expect it to be more of like a, a, in a few years, we'll find out kind of thing, as opposed to like immediately after we're done social isolation. Yeah, this is a, it's a complicated question. Um, I think the best way to divide it is short-term and long-term outcomes from this. Some short-term outcomes, probably what Paul mentioned, people coming in with withdrawal to drinking too much. Um, but then the long-term outcomes, a lot of the things like metabolic syndromes and um, fatty liver disease are built over a long time out of habit. And um, that's going to present later on, maybe decades after if they, if they continue that habit. And uh, I don't know about Canadian healthcare systems interesting. I think it's, it's good for some things, but it's not very good for a lot of things as well. Um, like um, it's a long wait list if you need surgery, if you need it's free so everybody can have it. So it's a really complicated question. I don't know what you think, Vivian. Yeah. It's hard to, I agree with you both, like it's, it's hard to evaluate immediate outcomes. And um, I am very involved in like harm reduction landscape, especially in BC and like other kind of effects of COVID on, on self-isolation. And um, especially in downtown East side is a lot of overdoses are happening um, for folks who like are using alone in their own apartments and then they don't call the ambulance or they don't, are, they're afraid of going to the hospital. Um, and so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, I hope there'll be a lot of research coming, coming out of in the next few months or years around like what, what actually happened. But in the short term, it's hard to also find ways to mitigate guidelines that have already been like produced. For example, like BCCSU just put up um, new guidelines for folks who have to go for like daily witness consumptions of, of their medications at the pharmacy. Now they get like a month of prescription. And what they're doing is they're like boiling down their Dilaudid or benzos and then they're injecting it because it's like they prefer to do that um, than taking these oral pills. And that's why they have to go every single day to the pharmacy to have someone watch them take their pills. Um, and so we're having a lot of issues with people like having this like limb ischemia um, and other like consequences of that. And so, I don't know, it's a very good question and a tough one to answer. And I think um, we won't have all the answers yet until at least like a couple months afterwards when we're able to, to look at the statistics and, um, and see what, what actually happened, um, which is a shame because it, people are, um, are suffering and are dying and there's not so much that we can we can do, especially from like the confines of our homes. Uh, we have a few more questions in the chat. Um, I will, I guess I'll read them out and you guys don't have to answer all of them. You can like pick which ones you want to answer. Uh, so the first one is, do you think that uh, the lack of medical ex expertise in politics at national and international levels will result in fewer substantial policy changes to prevent such pandemics in the future? Hi, Bruce. No? Okay. I was going to say that question as you were written all over it. <laughs> no, I was just trying to like, like break it down. And um, I, I would hope that 
maybe I'll answer it in a more positive light. Like I would hope that the increase in medical expertise in politics will result in better policy changes, um, more comprehensive changes and ones that are like made with understanding of from experience of actually having worked in the medical system. Um, because I think that's the bridging piece that is missing in a lot of these political discussions is they don't have the right stakeholders on the table. And unfortunately, a lot of physicians think they're like, they're really busy and understandably so, but they're, but then because of, because of that, they don't want to be engaged in politics and politics is messy, right? Like there's a lot of work, there's a lot of gray space. Um, and a lot of physicians are frustrated by that. And as a result, don't participate. Um, so it's uh, nuanced on many, many fronts, but please message me afterwards if you want to have a longer discussion. <laughs> I think I, I, I want to get to some of these personal questions. Yeah. Um, so we will look at the personal questions. Um, does anyone want to comment before we get to that on the thoughts on their province reopening plans? Just because it is there. So going in order. I don't know very much about it. Probably there's going to be a second wave when people relax and mm. social distancing stuff. It's going to happen. I will also comment that I don't... Uh, I also can't give any any real detailed info on that either, unfortunately. There's some cool AI out there that uh, is predicting it, but you know you don't have to do your own research on that. All right, to the personal questions then. So, what kind of shadowing or hospital experience did you guys have prior to med school, and um, how did that lead into your path? Bruce, you want to go first? <laughs> I, you know, I volunteer at a hospital, sign up some kids up on some studies, and, like, um, followed my, my mom's friend around who was a doctor. Uh, nothing too substantial, really. Nice. That's cute. That's kind of similar to, like, my story of, uh, it, it, I think in Canada it's illegal to be a pre-med and shadow. So just, like, heads up. I, th I don't think it's allowed. <laughs> Um, for like those of you who are interested in shadowing, like I think you can definitely find a friend, but like there's no official programs out there, uh, is what I'm just trying to say. Uh, for me, I was very lucky to be involved in like a pediatrics, um, kind of like a research project. I was actually a participant in a research project. Like I was a part, like, <laughs> in a, like a beta test of a trial. And so, and it was like a, like a one about, um, like fitness and like it involved an app and it was super fun. And so I was like this, I don't know, like 14 year old who was like, oh, like I'll just do it for some like, you know, gift card. And uh, I don't know, what I got. but <laughs> essentially it was, just, it was super fun. You wore this like app tracker that tracked like how much you ran and stuff. And I did lots of like track and field and was really active in, um, in high school. And so I was like, yeah, sure, sign me up. Um, and then from there, it kind of built a really good friendship with my, with the prof who was the PI on that project. And then similar to Bruce, like, she was like, yeah, why don't you just come follow me around? I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, you seem cool. And like, <laughs> the project seems cool. And so I did that. And then I uh, kind of stayed on when she got more grant funding um, to kind of do more of the like project pieces and not be a participant anymore. Um, but like, love the whole experience, loved being um, in the hospital. And it was really cool and novel. And I think that's actually what drew me to research. Um, before it drew me to medicine um, and the fulfillment you get from like planning something and having an idea in your brain and then to see it like to implement it and to have it result in outcomes that you're proud of um, yeah Paul? Paul? Um, yeah and like for me I don't think I like the last hospital experience I had prior to going to medical school was really uh, I don't know if you guys know what candy striping is but this is like way back in the day where you like volunteer at the hospital and you wear like these um, vests that are uh, striped, so they're red and white striped, and you, you basically go around and like give water to patients, and like that's about it. Um, and I did that in grade 11, but I didn't do it in, in undergrad, so I wouldn't say you need to do like any specific hospital experience. Um, I would also say like, you know, even if you do have the opportunity to shadow or uh, follow the doctor around, you should probably do it like once or twice, but you don't really get to do anything when you shadow, so like it's not like I wouldn't say it's that beneficial like there's a yeah there's a point where like you're you can shadow only so much and then you don't really learn that much because you're not doing anything you're just watching right um yeah you go and do stuff that you really want to do cool 
Um, and I think this is the last question we have, which is actually a very good question. And it's something that I, I kind of want to know too. Um, it's how did you adapt from your workload or schedule in undergrad to the workload and schedule of medical school, or I suppose later on residency? And what was some of the biggest changes you had to make? Great question. I think your studies focus, you become more of an independent learner for sure. It's less of trying to getting, get a 4.0 GPA to learning what you need for the future for the sake of your patients and to pass it, just pass your exams really. It's just pass and fail in medical school. That changes your approach to your work a lot. And uh, a lot of it is independent learning too. It's not that someone's sitting down with you to say you need to learn approach to anemia or whatever. You sometimes you just gotta go and review podcasts and um, learn it, learn it yourself. So I think that was a big, it was like a mentality shift for sure. And then later on in residency for medical school in terms of studying, it's just a, you're working at the same time that you're trying to study. So, uh, I mean, you're working over a hundred hours a week, but you also have to try and find time to learn your specialty and know, know these procedures you're doing on, on people's things because another shift from medical school to residency in terms of you can actually fine-tune your clinical skills to whatever you've chosen to specialize in. Yeah, um, med school is definitely time-consuming. Uh, you have to just really consolidate your time in a way that aligns with your priorities. And what I mean by that is like, you know, if your priority tomorrow is like you have an exam tomorrow, obviously your priority is going to be studying for that exam. And so uh, the way that I kind of did it was, or I'm, I'm doing it currently, uh, is just making sure that like my first priority is taken care of before I move on to the next thing that I need to do. It's obviously like a very logical thing, but um, sometimes you get bogged down with like a hundred different things. So it's hard to hard to keep perspective of, like what's the most important thing uh, and try to like keep a list of things of, um, you know, what I need to do on my phone. Uh, and biggest changes that I had to make was buying food more often. So <laughs> It's just so much time. Oh my goodness. It's crazy. Uh, Vivian? Yeah. Um, no, I resonate with what you both said. And I think the biggest thing is perhaps I'm, I'm kind of utilitarian in my approach to this, but I really agree with what Bruce said. Like med school is pass fail for a reason. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can slack and like just barely scrape by but it does mean that you have the freedom to um, be an independent learner and to learn in a way that um, yields like long-term benefits for yourself um, and not just like to get the 90% that you, you're expecting from undergrad on your test again. Um, I think a lot of this also um, requires you to put down your pride a little bit because I know all of us are and have been very successful people um, the Schulich scholars are incredible and I'm always so amazed at what everyone is doing and is able to do and, and also keep up like your grades. Um, but also we are people who maybe like in high school or in undergrad, like never saw uh, like a, like a bad grade. Right. And so it's like, oh, suddenly now in med school, you're used to being the person with the 90 or the 80. And now you're like the, the person with the 60 and 70. And I think you have to grapple with that. Um, for yourself and to acknowledge that I am choosing consciously to sacrifice, let's say 10% of my, my grade, that doesn't matter, um, to be able to be a better clinician in this way or to use my time in this way for a passion project or a research project that I really care about. Um, and I think you have to acknowledge that and, and say that this is what I'm choosing to do and make a conscious effort to, to wrestle with that for yourself. And everyone has a different balance of what they're comfortable with, then you just have to take some time to do some reflection and, and find what that is for yourself. Thanks, that's a really good answer all to all of you. I will keep that in mind, even for graduate sure. school. <laughs> um, so I think at this point, it's a little bit past uh, nine o'clock for the people on the East Coast. So let's start wrapping up. So I'm gonna ask if oh. anyone has any um, final comments they wanted to make, anything else you wanted to have just as a parting, little parting comment for everybody. Trina has a question. Yes, I did spot that. I mean, if you guys want to answer that, go ahead. 
I can't say I've worked with very many medical physicists. Uh, I worked with one. Um, Katrina, I, I worked with one in oncology, uh, not like directly work with them, but I've like, I know the person and there's a lot of opportunities to work as a medical physicist in oncology in the sense of like radiotherapy. They do a lot, a lot of stereotactic uh, therapies there where like there's these really cool machines that move in like a three dimensional space so that they can access uh, the tumor um, in the best way possible so that you can really ablate it properly. Uh, I don't know too much about it, unfortunately, but maybe I can, if you want to, you can reach out to me and I can uh, try and connect you with, with said person or um, something like that. Yeah, I was just going to mention that on is uh, one of the most tangible ways I think I've seen uh, medical physicists in action. Uh, it's super awesome and they do a lot of great work and um, I don't have personal connections, but it seems like Paul does. And so I'll definitely reach out in that way. Awesome. Yeah. So any final thoughts? Just appreciate you guys coming on. Hope you guys learned something. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, I would leave my email in the chat if you guys want to send me any questions or anything. Just message me anytime. I'll do my best to, to answer. If you ask me anything, I'll, uh, I'll try and help you or give you my honest thoughts on it. Can, can we ask you for a full written story of that patient who vanished from the... <laughs> oh, I got, I got one more story to end things off on. <laughs> okay, sure. That's okay. It was about... So at this point, I became the general surgery resident because urology, you got to do six months of general surgery. And so now I have my own medical student to send and go see consults. This is a patient who is with, with terrible constipation really, really bad constipation. I'm talking about like they hadn't had a bowel movement for like three weeks. It was really bad. It was passing cast, but it was literally hadn't passed him yet. So a medical student sees the patient, does the, the consult and um, then we talk, well, then we, then I'm like, okay, let's go see this patient. I'm playing the sandbox. Let's go play, let's go, let's go talk to the patient. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> we, talk, we, we talk to the patient. As part of the, as part of the, as part of the physical examination, something that they're always going to teach you, at least in general surgery and urology, that there's two reasons why you should never do a digital rectal exam on abdominal pain patient. One reason is you have no finger, and two is they don't have a butthole. So we do the digital rectal exam on this constipated patient, and it feels like, it feels like oh, no. I'm just like putting my finger against like a solid piece of wood or like a wall. I just like, boom, boom. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I, so, so I like maneuver my finger on the exam and it's like chipping away at the crust of like a creme brulee. And at one point my finger just goes in and three weeks worth of stool comes out at this medical student who happened to be standing downstream. And you know, like the meta, you know, like the, the crime scene of like someone who's passed away that's what it was like except this medical student was just sprayed in this person's fecal matter and i really felt bad for that student we sent him home afterwards so yeah, that's oh. probably my funniest student the funniest story as a resident Bruce, you're, okay. you're a resident that we don't want <laughs> 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 yeah, I might have gone on my review afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> that medical student is going to be telling that story for the rest of their lives. Yeah. <laughs> poor, poor student. <laughs> poor guy. So now everyone knows that if uh, if Bruce happens to be your resident, uh, you don't go along with him. <laughs> oh, hey, I will teach you a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Um, if no one else has any final parting messages, uh, we can say our goodbyes, I suppose. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Bruce, and I'm going to put my email uh, in the chat as well. Like, definitely feel free to ask any questions. I know that um, sometimes folks have more personal questions in regards to like how, what medical school is like and um, kind of you know details of that. And so I'm happy to 
try my best to answer. And so, um, yeah, feel free to message me afterwards. I'll do the same thing. All right, uh, Vivian, Bruce, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Guys, thank you so much for coming out. It's great that we had a, a live audience to interact with. Um, and yeah, I believe uh, that there's going to be a recording of this going up if you want to revisit it later in the future. Um, but for now, uh, have a wonderful evening. Have a great week. And Thanks for moderating, Alessia. You did a very good job. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks, Alessia. It's been fun. <laughs>